Okay. Our next speaker is a writer at Larian Studios, most recently working on Divinity Original Sin 2. She's also taught role-playing games and interactive narrative at both Trinity College Dublin and uh, DIT. Please welcome Charlene Putney. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> Bit of technical difficulty, I think that's my brand now. Uh, no matter how nicely set up it is in advance, I always happen to have this moment. So it's really nice to see you all here at Consul. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Uh, my name is Shar. I'm gonna be chatting to you today about writing for games. Um, specifically, we're gonna be moving towards looking at uh, writing choices um, for games. So, who am I? Well, the short answer is that I'm one of the writers at Larian Studios. Um, we released our epic role-playing game, Divinity Original Sin 2, on PC last year and on console just a small while ago. Um, we have a current Metacritic rating of 93, which we're super, super proud of. Um, and we won a BAFTA earlier this year for Best Multiplayer. So we're pretty into um, multiplayer and choice. This is our thing. Um, this is my beautiful uh, writing team, with slightly outdated pictures from our Christmas party last year uh, of the writing team. Um, and I'm just super grateful to work with these legends every single day. Um, one of the w things that I wanted to mention is that our writing team is quite different from the structure described by Molly and Eric yesterday, when they talked about the telltale uh, split between narrative design and writing and the responsibilities that those two sides have. In Larian, we actually do a kind of, the writers are all a kind of chaotic, uh, <laughs> Clump, who do all of those things together. So together we write the core story, we write the individual situations that are going to happen, we write the characters and their arcs, and then we go and write the dialogues as well. So what's this talk going to be about? Well, basically, over the last four years of working on crafting the kind of solid, meaningful, and emotional choices um, for Original Sound 2, um, I've learned a few methods, tricks, and shortcuts that I'd like to share with you um, today. I will hopefully help you with some practical help for writing on your next game. Now, one of the things is, these are all just my opinions. This is my way of working, and this is my way of doing things. So it might not resonate completely every single thing with you. Um, just take the things that you like and ignore the things that you don't like. That's how I take advice, kind of like what Gwen was saying earlier as well. Um, but we can't leap straight into generating compelling choices. Um, because the mind needs a little bit of a kickstart to get going with that kind of thing first. Um, so, oh, great. <laughs> um, so basically what we're going to do first is we're going to think about how to generate inspiration. And after we've looked at that for a little while, I'm going to talk a bit about structuring narratives. And then finally, we're going to have a look at creating compelling choices. So getting started. Here's the thing about getting started with writing. You can't just rub your hands together with glee and like leap into the seat at the, at the computer and be like, yeah, writing, let's go, and just fire straight into it. It doesn't really work like that, for me anyway. On the contrary, the best way to get started with writing is to slow down, to slow way down, and to just rest yourself, focus your mind, focus your energy and your breath, and just be. So it sounds kind of obvious to breathe, right? Like we do that all the time anyway. We're all breathing right now. So why make a special effort to try and breathe in a different way? <laughs> Sorry about the mic. Because sometimes our minds race ahead of us and they take, like taking a moment to just pause and center ourselves can help us to unlock an extra layer of creativity that we wouldn't have otherwise. So let's try it now, just for two minutes. Everybody, close your eyes. If you're comfortable with doing that, because it works better when you close your eyes. Don't worry, I'm not going to pull some sort of strange trick on you or anything. Um, so now that you have your eyes closed and you're resting, I want you to breathe in for a count of four. So in, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four. In, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four. And just keep breathing in this rhythm for a few moments with your focus on your breath, letting your thoughts just slide away as any of them enter your mind. <coughs> just 
just a few more breaths. In for four, and out for four. Okay. And now open your eyes. And I wonder, do any of you feel any different than you did before you sat and took a few moments to breathe? I always feel completely different when I do that. And if you feel, if you do this for just five minutes first thing in the morning, or any time you start to feel overwhelmed, it can really help with actually making you more able to create. You can't really create when you're in this manic, uh, energetic kind of state. And speaking of thinking and creating, after you've done the breathing, the next thing is stop thinking. Is this really annoying or is it just my ear? It's okay? Okay. Um, so yeah, stop thinking. Really. Because when you first sit down to write, thinking is actually your enemy. You don't want to force anything to begin with. Don't worry, you're going to be forced later to do the writing. But when you begin, <laughs> the first few moments is a really precious time to let your subconscious through and let your creativity flow. So after you've done your five minutes breathing, you just start to write. You take out your pen and your page and you begin to write. And you write until 10 minutes have passed. And this is known as the morning pages exercise in the brilliant book, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, which I highly recommend for anybody creative. You don't edit. You don't take your pen off the page. You don't try to make it be anything. You're not trying to write a story. You're not trying to make it be neat. It doesn't have to make sense. You're just writing and writing and writing until the time is up. Even if what you start writing is, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Why, why, why? Eventually, your hand will start writing something different and you'll get into something else. And your subconscious will take something out of that and give you something to work with later. And what you write on these pages will probably really suck, like a lot. And that's totally fine, because it doesn't have to be good. We want to think about it like those rooms that the Romans had in their banquet halls in the past, the vomitoriums, you know, where they'd eat in all the food and then they'd puke it all up so they could eat more food and have more fun. It's like you want to purge yourself of these racing thoughts of your chattering monkey mind so that the good stuff can come, can flow. The words that only you can write and those are the only words worth writing. So once you're done writing, <laughs> You want to read back over what you wrote, preferably with some kind of highlighter pen or a different colored pen, and just mark out anything that seems interesting to you. A word or a phrase, a small little thing, anything that sparks something. Just hunt through that junk and find some little diamonds. And then that's it. Then you go make your coffee, you get on the bus, you walk to work, you have a shower, maybe not in that order, but you do all those things <laughs> and you let your mind do the work for you while you, you know, just rest. It's, it's still going, still working. And if you do the five minutes of breathing and the 10 minutes of writing like this every morning for a week, I guarantee you that your consciousness will be changed and your writing will be vastly better. I guarantee. So this is my secret weapon when I'm looking for inspiration. It's the one thing that never fails me is my trusty little notebook. If you keep an inspiration notebook and refer back to it on dull days, it can save your writing. It saved mine on more cases than I can count. This is the kind of thing it looks like. <laughs> you want to make it like a nice notebook. It gives you joy to look at, creamy pages, just the right thickness of paper. You carry it everywhere with you. You write down things you hear on the bus. You write down things people say to you. You write down anything that just pops into your head, whether it's in a real notebook or in your Evernote, anything like that. And I was inspired to do this when I went on a writing retreat with my favorite author, M. John Harrison. And he was reading us a short story that he had, writ uh, that he had just written. And when we asked him what the inspiration was for the story, he told us that he keeps his notebooks like this out in the garage. And this was from a small little fragment of writing that he had written down in 1973. And it was then 2013, it was like 40 years later, he had something come out of that amazing notebook. So it works. And other things we can do is we can trick our subconscious. Tarot cards are a really good prompt. You can have a single card plucked from a freshly shuffled deck, 
or my favorite exercise of all, which is to draw three cards and then make a story that connects the three of them together in some kind of time constraint, five minutes or 10 minutes. This is the Eoticism Tarot deck by my friend Zali Krishna, Eotar on Twitter. And you can use any kind you like. You don't even have to use tarot cards. If you have like board games like Mysterium or Dixit, any kind of little thing that has cards with different pictures on them. So I did this exercise. Um, I used to teach interactive narratives uh, in Trinity College Dublin and DIT as well, and in the Irish Writers' Centre. And I did this exercise a few weeks ago uh, with a full workshop, and they were really sceptical because they, they are just they were just new in, you know. They hadn't been. They had just gotten into the door. They don't just had their first coffee. They weren't really into the flow yet. But they did this in 10 minutes, and afterwards they were like super bright-eyed, really excited. They all wanted to, to read their story, the thing that they had made out of, out of these cards. They felt, everything felt that the thing they had was special. So yeah, you can try it if you want. You could take a photo of it. You could take your notebook now, spend the next few minutes writing your story, having an idea. You don't need to think about the meanings. It doesn't matter. It's just about getting into your brain and letting your kind of pattern recognition machine roll over things. And it can be anything. You can just throw some leaves and stones in the air and see what they look like when they land. Or you can open up the dictionary and look at a word. Or pick out some random scrabble tiles and see what the first word that you see in the letters that you pick out is. It doesn't matter. If you give the randomness a chance, it will have something to say to you. Then we have uh, the Dice Man method, is another one that I like. Um, so the Dice Man is a book from 1971. Uh, it focuses on the character of a psychiatrist who begins using a dice to make all of his decisions. Okay, you want a new thing? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah? Oh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> okay, so the Dice Man is a book that focuses on a psychiatrist. And he starts to use the dice to make all of his decisions. So he starts to pick six things that he could do in any instance, and then roll a dice and see which one of the things that he would do. And of course, you can imagine that over the time of the book, his decisions get more and more extreme, and they become more and more outrageous, and he starts doing even crazier things. And the key part was that there always had to be one choice on the dice that he really did not want to do. Um, and having the commitment to follow through on that after rolling. So, I mean, yeah, you don't want to do this in your real life and have, like, murder my neighbour as choice number six, but you could have it as get my NPC to murder my neighbour as one of the choices and go from there. So it just opens up possibilities of things you might not consider if you have to write down six options instead. Um, Cut-up technique is another great way of getting inspiration. So this is from uh, cutting up existing text and then rearranging it just by the way that your brain sees the words and putting them together in some new order. And this was invented by the um, artist and occultist Brian Agaisen in the 50s, who worked a lot on this with William Burroughs. And they thought that actually doing this brought out the real meaning of the text, because of what it was doing was bringing out the real meaning of the text for them. And I'll tell you, if you get like a newspaper and you just do this for 10 minutes in the morning, you'll also be kind of amazed at the weird stuff that you're able to pull out of it. It's pretty cool. So yeah, you can do it with any text you want. Prompts are another amazing way of generating inspiration. You can take a writing prompt and then just write on it for 10 minutes. So you can pick a favorite quote. This is my favorite quote of all time. Just write and write and write on it until you don't have anything else to say. You can take one of, pick a number from 1 to 30 and write on one of Jack Kerouac's 30 rules of writing. You can read bits of poetry that make your mind feel like it's going to explode. You can look at pictures in galleries. You can read non-fiction and essays, anything that feels nourishing to you. Photographs of long dead sculptors. Your own desk. Don't just sit in a boring cubicle. Surround everything with things that make you happy and excited and interested in what you're working on. Go outside. Make small rituals for your days. And this, I used to walk this way to work, and there was a heron who used to stand on that exact rock every morning to say hello to me on the way to work. I wrote a lot of things about that heron, actually. <laughs> Even managed to put him into the game as well. So, you know, you can use anything as a prompt. You just have to open your eyes and look around at the world. And really give yourself permission to be super bad at it. What you write in your like, writing prompts, what you write in your morning pages, it's probably going to be terrible. Mine is. Super terrible. 
Um, but it's okay, because you're going to make it good. It's hard, it's, you know, it's hard to give ourselves permission to not be good at things, but it's important just that we do it. It'll be bad, and we'll make it good. But literally nobody writes first drafts that are perfect the first time. Um, that's just not how writing works in my experience. And I could be doing it wrong, but I've also never met a writer who was like, yeah, just wrote this, and it's amazing. And they're like, I just wrote this, and it's the worst thing I've ever seen. And you know, seven tries later, they, they think, well, maybe it's OK for you to read, but nobody else. That kind of thing. So you know, you just got to try. You just got to be really bad. And then you just got to try it again. And just keep failing until you're actually satisfied enough with the failure that you have that you're willing to let other people have a look at it too. Because you can't wait around with writing for the muse to come and visit you. She doesn't really do that. She only comes when you've already built her a kind of a home out of words um, that she feels welcome in. You just have to put your pen on the page and not stop writing until something happens. Because something will always happen. Even when you're not writing, things are going to happen. Because as a writer, your work is happening all the time. You can be crafting when you're doing yoga, you can be crafting drawing on whiteboards, you can do a jigsaw puzzle at your desk, you can have your lot of ideas in the shower. And it still work. Because just because your ass is not in the chair looking at the screen, it doesn't mean you're not working when you're a writer. You have to appreciate yourself in the moments where you're not doing what other people would consider to be work. Because creativity doesn't like clock on at 9 a.m. and close out at 5. It just doesn't really work like that. And then, yeah, you need to move your body too. Because when you're stuck with writing, um, sometimes it's because your body is actually stuck. Because if you think about it, you know, we're all just these soft animals padding around on the face of the earth. And everything that our mind wants to break free from, like we're stuck in it all the time. There's no escape. You can't not be in your body. You're in your body. Everything we do is done using our bodies. Even the thinking that we like to do to escape from our bodies is done using a part of our bodies. So it stands to reason that then affecting our physical form can also affect our mental space too and that releasing the tensions in our bodies can also release emotion and creativity. Yoga is super good for this, um, for re releasing tension in your shoulders, releasing tension in your body. So I don't know if people are going to be like super into this, but I don't know. We're going to try and do a little bit of yoga now, if anyone's into it. Sitting yoga, not like standing and dancing around yoga. But we just have five little poses, and if we do them five times each, you know, we'll get somewhere. So first of all, we're going to do seated cat-cow. So basically, on an inhale, stretching forward, exhale, pulling back. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Just do five of these. It's really good, stretching into the shoulders, stretching out the sides of the body. Cool. And then, just raising up arms, like really stretching up high, and then letting your arms fall. Super nice. <laughs> I feel like this is like a Mexican wave here. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> Beautiful. OK. Now, going to get a little bit exciting, a little <laughs> twisting side stretch. So exhaling on the way down on both sides. Try not to hit anyone in the face. If anyone hits you in the face, be nice. <laughs> Beautiful. Then get a little bit forward on a little bit of seated pigeon, so crossing one leg over the other and just leaning forward. The hips are a place where a lot of like emotion and tension gets held, so if you feel like that really hurts right in your hip, just try and feel the pain and just go with it. Don't hold on, don't squeeze. <laughs> just like, go with it. Very nice. Both sides. Come on. <laughs> and then last one, just do a little side stretch. So you don't need to move your chair, but just like holding on to the back of the chair, all the way to the left, and all the way around to the other side. Now, anybody feel different from doing that? 
a little bit more awake. I have to say, there's a marked difference in energy in the room <laughs> from here, uh, from watching that happen. So it's super good. Like, see how long that took? You didn't have to stand up. You didn't have to lie on the floor and do anything weird. You're just sitting at a chair. You could do that at your desk. You could do that once an hour at your desk. Not a problem. Feel a little bit better. Feel a little bit looser. And then, you know, now we can work, you know? We've breathed. <laughs> We've uh, moved our bodies. We've thought about, you know, esoteric ideas of how to like generate inspiration. And now we sit down at the desk to do something. So now we can look at structuring our narratives in a very professional way. So as you can see, it's extremely simple. You just can follow at the bottom. It's very easy to follow. Not really, <laughs> because uh, fancy graphs and complex formulas about writing are not really my way um, and my, or of, of making stories and things work. Uh, rather, I think we should begin when we think about structuring narratives by asking ourselves, what is story? So uh, there's one word that basically tells us what story is. Um, can anybody tell me what that word is? I mean, you could just start throwing out words a little bit, you know. Sausage. Sausage. <laughs> That's a really good story that I'm definitely going to be looking for later at the hot dog stand. <laughs> but uh, anyone? Yeah? Conflict. conflict. Damn, first off, story is conflict. Yeah, <laughs> somebody give that guy a special prize. I should have, like, sweets to throw or something. So... Story is conflict. It's always conflict. You, uh, it can be an internal conflict in yourself, or it can be an external conflict um, in the way the world around you is working. Um, the thing, yeah, the thing that wants you, that you want can be internal or external, but there is something. At the beginning, I lose something. The middle, I set out to find it, and the end, I must either find it, it remains lost, or my search continues. So everything is driven by conflict at every stage. And the character always drives the action, which leads to change in the world around them and growth in them themselves. But more than that, story is myth and religion. It's how we understand who we are and how you relate to others. And it connects us to the past and the future. Can you think of anything else that connects us so solidly to the past and then the way that we can tell things, people in the future will be able to look back and know who we are? And it's the vehicle through which we can release our own unique viewpoints to the world and let other people look through our eyes. So this is what I was saying earlier, writing the words that only you can write is the way of getting across your personal story to the world. And anything that you've read or experienced in a game, in a movie, in a song, is something that one person was feeling extremely strongly and using their own personal uh, experiences and viewpoints and, and everything to drive to share that with you. And we tell ourselves stories all the time. They can have huge power. So how much bigger is the potential with stories when we are asking a player to step into, their, into our shoes? We're not just telling them what happened. We're not just sharing you know, an idea of what could happen. We're saying, what do you do in this situation? Here we are. Here's the world the way I'm, I'm, I'm showing it to you. I'm showing you the world the way I see it. What are you going to do? How do you walk? And if we think about setting a structure to stories, the very first thing that springs to most people's minds is the hero's journey. Hey, it makes sense. All stories, stories share some common structures, some common character archetypes. Some stories have all of this, like The Matrix and Star Wars. Some have a little bit, but none have nothing of it at all. It's the basis of a huge amount of famous stories because it connects with some inner things that we all tried and tested knowledge way of thinking about things. But, and I think it can help you if you're trying to tweak a story you already have, if you think something is lacking something. But in, I personally find that following it like a kind of a gospel of how to structure a story will lead you to very generic tales. Like plotting <coughs> adventures that lack the spark of human soul. And I prefer to use something a little bit looser, a rough three-act structure that would follow a general shape like Kurt Vonnegut's story shapes here. You can see the tendencies for different shapes of stories 
in terms of high points and low, low points. And the vast majority of stories will still follow a kind of loose structure that's very similar to the hero's journey, which is either New Testament or Cinderella. They're actually the same. Going up, dropping down into a cliff, and then going up again to a slightly higher point than it was before. I prefer bad to worse, but I rarely get to do that. So how does interactivity change stories? Anyone? Another one word? Choice, exactly. And even the illusion of choice can be a powerful thing sometimes. So when we're structuring interactive narratives, it's most important to consider every single moment as a moment of choice. A moment where we give the player agency in the world that we've flung them into. And then we get to let them choose how they're going to react to that. So we're going to get back to making those meaningful choices in a little bit later. But for now, let's get started with how we can even craft them at all. So a fantastic free tool for prototyping story structures is called Twine. Has anyone here used Twine before? Yeah, loads of people. Awesome. Twine is how I got started with writing games at all, and I still absolutely love it and teach it to my students all the time. So if you haven't heard of Twine and you don't know what it is, um, head to twinery.org. Um, like later today, I mean today is Friday, if you started a nice Twine game this evening, you could publish it, you know, by Sunday have hundreds of people have read it by the time you wake up on Monday morning. It's super easy to use, it's super easy to publish on, and it has a vast network of people who are eager to read what you make with it. So you just start with like a little blank passage, this is exactly kind of what it looks like when you go in there. And you use the simple syntax, as you can see there, it's just inside square brackets, it's super easy. Link your passage to new options. On a side note, it's extre extremely similar to our Divinity uh, uh, dialogue editor in terms of the way that it links passages together. So if you're able already to make things in Twine, why not try modding something in our editor? Um, because that's out there and available too. But yeah, you keep building and building and building until your choices and your branches, until you have all of your story ideas in there already. And then you want to look at those and you want to see how it looks and think about the shape what is the shape of what you've made because in general when you start out making interactive fiction or branching narratives the shape is going to be like this but more it's going to keep on getting bigger and bigger in this kind of cheese wedge effect situation and as you add more and more options into your story you're going to notice this you're going to create lots and lots and lots of content that people may never ever see. And yes, we do that, of course we do that, because we want people to have real choice, real experiences and real consequences. But when you're starting out, you want to <laughs> not, do, not let it get so out of hand. You want to start out by creating a limited amount of choices that you can then build on, make it work first, so that you don't make two hours worth of content that somebody can play through in four minutes, because it gets out of hand really, really fast. So this is another a uh, way of looking at structuring of uh, narratives. And this is um, Dan Fibulich from Cho Choice of Games. He has a whole article about making, using delayed branching, which is what he calls this, to create better choice situations for games. So when you're making a small game, this is a good way to look at how to make your choices work. Placing limitations on yourself. It can help you to not spiral out of control, because you can always add in more choice and craziness later. But if you start out with the more basic side of things, then you're not going to get lost and like overwhelmed too fast. So when you've made your choices, making your little twine game, you're making your game, you make all your choices, you try it out, you see how it feels, and you play it. And you think about, is it fun? When you have your rough structure, you've stubbed it out in twine, and you play through it. How does it feel? Is it fun when you go through those branches? Does it feel like one of the answers is the right answer and the other one was just, you know, stuck in there to give you a, an option? Did the person already, when they were writing it, have in mind that this was the way you were going to go through the story, the correct way? You don't want that. You don't want there to be a correct way. Um, yeah, so like, don't, don't have an obvious choice. You don't want it to feel like a slog. So if you do this kind of QA on your own work, every step of the process will give you the sense of your story's beating heart. But when you do it, this is what you're more likely to feel. It is not fun. Because the first iteration often is not fun. 
you need to think about how you're going to make those choices better and more fun. And the reason it's not fun is due to a lack of meaningful choices, most of the time. Sometimes it's due to other things, but most of the time it's a lack of meaningful choices. So, like I said earlier, I used to teach interactive fiction at university in Ireland. And one year I had a class of 40 students who were doing a master's. And out of, they were doing a master's in creative digital media. And out of the 40 students, in one, <laughs> I got them to start their twine projects. And 12 of them had started their twine projects after day one with the exact same choice. And this is it. I don't know what it is about twine that does this to people, but it really seems to bring out in people this like <laughs> tendency to feel like, well, what, what, what's a good choice? What happens first in the day? Oh, I get up, okay. And um, okay, so is this a good choice? No, it's a terrible choice. <laughs> it's awful. Why is it a terrible choice? Because you just repeat it, it's a loop. If I hit the snooze button, my next choice is going to be get up or hit the snooze button again. And so on, and so on, and so on, until I choose the right choice, which is getting up. You see what I mean about the right choice? You never want it to feel like there's a right choice. So one of my students did actually end up making his entire thesis game around this exact thing to prove to me that he could make this be a good choice, using lots and lots of JavaScript and tracking in order to make it actually have consequences from the initial choice. And he did a really good job. But I don't think most people could do a really good job of that. A choice has to have consequence. A choice has to be meaningful. So how can we actually make our choices feel meaningful? So I've got a few ideas, a few things that I do. One is using physicality in choices. Is this a good choice? Yes, thank you, Oscar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a better choice than get up, you know, or hit the snooze button anyway, because it involves actual action and actual consequences. I'm either leaning in to actually aggressively punch him in the face, or I'm backing away and, like, removing myself from the situation. Both of these things are going to have consequences in whatever context the thing is happening. Here's one from Original Sin 2 that we had, where you get to choose whether you're going to be the first person to use Ifan's bow when he gets it. And he goes, yeah, do you want to fire the first shot? And if you're like, no, nah, you do it. You know, he actually uh, shoots a rabbit and you end up getting rabbit meat um, for it and a better companion attitude, which is pretty cool. Um, if you shoot it yourself, you're not as good. <laughs> and of course, if you bat the crossbow out of his hands, he's not super happy about that either. So you can also turn inside, so physicality, external world, or you can go to the inner world, to the inner turmoil. And you can look at things like that. You can tell the truth, or you can lie. You can use what's happening inside of a character's mind to tell a bit more about the story, uh, and to give you the idea of like how, even if the character doesn't want to admit something, there's a little worm struggling inside them that wants to tell a truth. We can look at things like good versus evil. Questions of morality are a good place in which choices can be made. Is it just as evil if you don't do something about evil that you witness? What happens if you do a little bit of evil in order to do good? Do the ends ever justify the means? What does it mean to be a good person? These kind of questions can lead to good choices. But I don't want the fact that I've shown all these things as A and B choices to make you think that binary choices are a good idea, because I don't think they're a good idea either. I prefer three to five options at every juncture, at least. Consequences. So, for a choice to, have, to be meaningful, it has to have consequences. If you think about the examples above, there's consequences for each of them, either in the outer world or in the inner world. And if you can already have the consequences of your choices implied, in the wording of the choices as you give them, that can be really, really powerful for players. And consequences can happen in other ways. Also, I'll show you a personal consequence. This is my favorite Original Sin 2 meme uh, that people made on Reddit after they were playing. And for the third time, the third time, Ifan ended a dialogue 
with uh, looking to the horizon. <laughs> and after I saw this, I went scurrying to search through our internal uh, dialogues to see how often he does this. And it's five. He does it five times between the horizon and the middle distance. He's always looking off somewhere as a way of ending dialogues. So, you know, this is a cautionary tale to you uh, to watch out for the things that you do on autopilot and think about automatically and not to do them. Or you could have people mocking you on Reddit also. Um, another thing is fun, okay? So you can make good choices by making what seems like the really suboptimal choice actually really rewarding. So here's a character called Featherfall. He's a, a condor and his master is dead beside him. This is a slight spoilers for Original Sin 2 if any of you don't want to know, you hold your ears for a few moments. But um, basically, he's, uh, he, he, his master is dead, and he's there pecking away at the master, and you know, thinking about the master told him you are what you eat, so he's he's going for it, and uh, you, you know, you basically can choose if you wish. It's not the it's not the super obvious choice, but you can choose to actually like pluck some of the disgusting rotting meat out of the master's <laughs> corpse and chew it, and it's disgusting. And it makes you really think about yourself and who you are as a person. <laughs> but at the end of it, uh, you know, after a little bit more persuading after that, Featherfall is like, oh, cool, okay, you, you know, you're the master now. And he comes with you. And uh, you have summoned Condor skill from then on. So sometimes making like the fun, stupid, weird choice that nobody, you know, is super likely to do, you can actually create a kind of fun branch out of it and make it really rewarding. Another thing is character reactions. So making character attitudes like paramount. So just like in real life, you know, we want people to love us. We don't want to do things that make our family and friends, you know, mad at us. You want to make your characters react with like love or agitation or, or worse, or malice to your players' choices. And you can make decisions much more juicy. So can I get like two volunteers from the front row? <laughs> yeah, come on up, Gwen. <laughs> Just one more person. It, you don't even, yeah, okay, cool, awesome. Okay, so here we have our two people. Now, the situation is this. We have a party in our game, and we're about to head out into the icy wastes in search of the most important object of all time, the ring of justice. Now, we only have one slot left in our party, and we have to choose between these two. One, Villar over here on the right, is our uh, best friend, our BFF forever, since we were children. Uh, <laughs> been with us all the way, but is a little bit outclassed in this particular situation. However, Villar, his little brother, went missing in the very place we're going to go to, and he's been talking about it nonstop for a good 35 hours now of <laughs> voice bark banter all along the way. So you know he really wants to come with you, even though he's not going to be super helpful. Or Jeff. Jeff. No nonsense, gruff person you don't have any feelings for. <laughs> In fact, are kind of scared of them because they mutter under their breath at night around the bonfire about blood, it seems like, with a gleam in their eye. The idea of camping under the stars is no picnic with them for three nights. But on the other hand, you're going to be safer with their skills. So which one are you going to pick? Villar or Jeth? So can we get hands up for Villar? OK, a lot of loyalty in this room. <laughs> hands up for Jeth. <laughs> well, it's actually uh, not too far away from 50-50, but I think the Villars have it. Thank you, volunteers of loveliness. <laughs> so. <laughs> If we look at what happens when we pick them, uh, it's going to lead to a very different situations. So no matter what you do, you can end up with the ring of justice. This is the thing you wanted all along, so it's what you're going to get. But it's a very different way in which you get it. So with Valar, you're going to find his brother shot with a poison arrow, he's distraught. He's even worse at fighting than he was uh, coming in. You have to fight even harder to protect him. But his brother left behind a little diary and it helps you with the traps so you can get to the Ring of Justice without being further scathed. So you get it, but then when Valar, you know, he's really grateful to you, but he's also like super depressed now. So, you know, he's not like really excited about uh, being in the party anymore. So you come home with the Ring of Justice, but your friend is no longer the fun-loving party animal that he was. 
on the Jet side, you know, he does in fact be even worse as a companion than he was when you first had him. And yeah, you find him carving sigils on the ground in blood. He tells you to mind your own business. You're not going to argue with that, you know. <laughs> Just back away. And then, yeah, he, uh, he kills someone. Still sound in the bushes, a young man. You find a map, get past the labyrinth's traps unscathed. But then, of course, Jeth wants the Ring of Justice. So he turns on you to get it. And yeah, you can fight him back, but it's going to scar you for life. And you're also down a party member. So basically, using like just even the idea of character attitudes, you're going to get the Ring of Justice. You get the Ring of Justice, but some but different ways, different things happen. Okay. So, and this is a weirder method for writing good choices, which is using your own personal discomfort and your own personal like, problems in life. Because life is really hard, a lot of the time, for everybody. And when life is hard, the natural human reaction is to like hide away is to try and like pretend you don't feel it and to run away from it. But I want to suggest that just like with that, uh, you know, that little forward pigeon pose that we did earlier on the chair, that you kind of, you just stay in it. You stay and you feel the pain because that place is a place where the words will come from that only you can write. That's the place where your experiences and the things that you have to say, your experiences that you can share with other people and make their lives better. And you'll learn something completely unique, you know, just like the pearl and the oyster. It gets there because the oyster is not happy about the unpleasant grit inside it. It makes something beautiful out of it. And humans do that all the time. That's where a lot of really great art comes from. Human pain. So you can create a priceless pearl, you know, from your own suffering. And that'll help you to create compelling choices that'll resonate with other human beings who are just struggling, just like you. Okay, so now for my absolute favorite exercise for making ch compelling choices. I call it 50-50. So this is where you try to think of a choice where 50% of people presented it with it will go one way, 50% will go the other way, and neither of them will understand the other people who made the choice. It's extremely hard to create a really good binary choice. If you try this later, you know, after the convention, like you're in the pub tonight, spend five minutes each and try and think of a really good one and see which one amongst your friends can win and get the closest ratio to 50-50. It's not easy. Let's have a look at one. We are on a spaceship, all of us, here. And something has gone terribly, terribly wrong, as it is wont to do. There are <laughs> two escape pods. One of them holds the last mating pair of tigers in the entire galaxy. The other holds 50 orphans. There is only enough fuel to launch one escape pod. Which escape pod do you send? Now, who <laughs> amongst you <laughs> picks the tigers? Yeah. <laughs> and who amongst you picks the orphans? Yeah, so that's about 50-50. And you're all horrified at each other, right? How could you let the tigers go extinct? How could you kill 50 kids? And it's that kind of choice that makes really, really compelling choices in games. So try it later and see what you get. Uh, this is, the, I, honestly, if you're ever sitting down to write choices in a game and you're not sure uh, how to make it, this is the one thing I would do before anything else. So my last thoughts before I finish, I think I'm actually in good time, amazingly. So yeah, when in doubt, get weirder. Um, you can't make something that everyone will love. There's no point in even trying. Uh, it's the road to absolute mediocrity. Um, you've got to find your niche. You've got to find either crazy weirdos who are going to like the same stuff that you like, and you're going to make something for them. You're going to make something that you're going to love and something that they're going to love because they and you are the same kind of person. You make the thing that one, will make one person's life like light up with joy and recognition. And if you start with yourself, then you'll be able to make something that other people will resonate with too. And the sad thing is, the number one way to be a better writer and better at making choices is just to write consistently, always, over and over again, more and more and more, because nobody can teach you anything that is more valuable, uh, that is as valuable as sitting down <laughs> with your ass in the chair and putting your pen to the page. That's going to teach you more than any writing workshop or lecture or anything could ever do. But if you do that, if you do your five minutes breathing and your 10 minutes preparatory writing and some prompt and you go for it, 
you know, magic's going to happen. And yeah, you can totally do it. Your creators, people making magic in the world, everyone says they want to make things, but you guys are actually here, making things, doing things. That's awesome. So yeah, well done, everyone. And that's it for me. Thanks so much for having me. I think it was a great time. Does anyone have a question? Yes. Who's your favorite character in Twenty Two, and why? Ooh. <laughs> um, my favorite character in Original Sin Two is a dead owl called Jimmy, that I, I wrote in an absolute manic haze of crunch, and um, that I put all of my weirdest humor around and into him and the other owls surrounding him. So he's my favorite. But my other favorite is probably the If and Origin, because I wrote him and I loved the whole process of writing him from start to finish and getting to create somebody from scratch and make them a person. Uh, regarding that the uh, writing exercise you showed yes. us earlier, I believe it was Dice Man. The Dice Man. Yeah. Method? Yes. Have you? I, I'm really interested. Have you ever used it to uh, write something that was implemented within Divinity? Mm, yes. From that method. Yes, of course. <laughs> like, like what? Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I don't know. I can't think of one that like specifically off the top of my head, but I have used it. For sure. I'm sorry. That's amazing. Thank you. One. Sorry. I'll probably think of it tonight and wake up at 2 a.m. <laughs> okay. Um, out of all the weird, the, the que which uh, choice that you kind of written that the player can have is the weirdest uh, that you think you made that you like? The weirdest choice. I mean, probably the eagle one, because it's so disgusting, and and yet it gives you such a good reward. I think that's probably the weirdest. Um, I don't know. There's also other choices, like there's a spider that I that I wrote who like uh, if you have already kissed a different spider in the game, <laughs> when you get to this spider, <laughs> they they smell the other spider on you, and then they have a whole thing where they'll like knit you gloves out of their silk uh, to help you do things. But like, you know, to get to these points, you have to have done so many other things that, yeah, that probably, it's, it's all about spiders and owls and eagles for me. It's, <laughs> it's where all the good choices are. I love Divinity Original Sin 2. Oh, it's good. amazing. Thank you. <laughs> my first party I created with my friends, we actually picked Ibn as our uh, companion. Nice. Uh, and I didn't realize how useful talking to animals would be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, my question I'm stealing, by the way, the yoga chair thingy. I'm stealing that. Hello. Uh, do you, when you write, do you start from a character point of view or world building or uh, some sort of experience point of view? How do you, you mean for the game? Uh, yeah, the or game? Uh, like, yeah, or when you write in general. Okay, well, um, like if I'm talking, about, thinking about writing like something in the game, a dialogue in the game, um, like we'll we'll have, we'll have started by like we we'll, we write the core story, like all the writers together, and then we write the individual situations, and so then I'll be looking at the particular situation, um, and like the things that need to happen in that situation, like there's the things that need to happen that to get the story moving, and there's the fun things that you add in that are the you know the juice, the good stuff, and so I'll usually start by taking the dialogue, and then I can't really do things on the computer as well as I can do them on paper because I'm old. So I'll get a pen and my paper and I'll get like a load of papers out on my desk and I'll start like actually like drawing out, okay, who is this character? Who are they? What are they like? And then I'll just start writing random bits of like fragments of the kind of thing they might say, who they might be. And almost always um, something that will happen in the character is something that was like, that's like bothering me at the moment. 
in my personal life, like something that's upsetting to me or, or interesting to me or, or inspiring to me, that like, because I, you know, happened to sit down beside somebody on the bus that day who was like shouting in my ear and like super drunk at 9 a.m., you know, that carries with you into the day. And then the person that you're writing is like, what, how did this person get to be like this? What's going on in their life? Oh, you know, and you kind of turn the world into the characters that are on the page. And then once I have it all on the page in a giant jumble of mess, I should have taken a few photos of, of my messy, awful pages to share, but like when it's all there in a mess, then I'll start putting it into the dialogue editor and like tweaking it from there. But it's kind of a combination of mess applied to the existing structure we already have of core story and situations. Now, for some people, when they play the video game XCOM, you're supposed to play it with the Iron Man mode, meaning every soldier you lose is permanently dead. For a lot of people, that is like, uh, th they won't. They simply won't. And in games such as Shadowrun, where your choices do matter, there are some situations where you have to make several choices correctly, or you won't get the uh, best outcome. Uh, so, the, my question is, when you try and make uh, choices that won't leave a person scarred and not wanting to pick up the game again, because <laughs> they're afraid to get the situations uh, that they ultimately wanted without having to go and redo the same situation several times. Yeah. What were like the thought process to try and avoid that kind of abysmal situation for the player? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, and actually that's just that's something that our creative director Sven Vinske uh, like calls like N plus one design. So that like no matter what way you play our game, you have to be able to still do everything. Like so, yes, you can end up with like you know a, a, something happening with a character or a compa like a companion or an NPC or something like that. But at the end of the day, you need to be able to do every single um, uh, kind of mission or quest or situation through the main storyline of the game, um, regardless of who. If you kill every single person in the game, you still need to be able to finish the game, basically. And so that is actually a huge part that's already put into our design, but it's not something that's 100% designed by the writers like you know we have loads of people who, who do that stuff as well like a you know combat designer we've got our scripters we've got a lot of people and Sven of course overlooking the whole thing to make sure that there's always a way that they always try and, they, and our QA team we've got an amazing QA team and they're always trying to, to break everything and see you know okay if I do this can I still do it if I do this can I still do it and then they always come back and tell us the things we need to fix so there's always a way thanks Hi. Uh, Hi. So, so I was wondering if, uh, w when you reward uh, a player for his choice, do you uh, reward a player equally, based no. on which, or you? Okay. <laughs> no. W why is that? Why? Because uh, that's just not how the reality is. <laughs> I don't know because it's not interesting if everything is rewarded equally, like on balanced completely and side to side, like you get this XP for this and this gold for this and they both correspond roughly to the same situation. No. If you don't eat the master's disgusting rotting kidney, you just don't get the summon condor skill. There's no other reward. There's no separate thing. You just don't get it. So it's like, I think there's still, uh, I think there's a great um, enjoyment in playing games that aren't super symmetrical and don't reward you for everything that you do but that actually make you make the choices that you're going to make and then deal with the consequences of those choices i mean of course you can always reload but like you know you can still play the whole game through to the end no matter what choices you make but it's interesting along the way you get your condor you don't your spider you're not etc etc does that make sense Oh, sorry, this is the last question I've been told. Hi. There we go. Hello. Oh, hello. Um, <laughs> uh, I was really fascinated when you said that you much prefer choices that have three or five answers at the end yes. instead of just a binary choice. Is that uh, from your perspective as a writer, or do you think that the audience, the end, the end players, prefer that to binary choices? Um, so this is my, my personal opinion, but like I, I prefer it as a player. 
I hate being forced into a you know either or choice and um, that doesn't feel like it reflects a full range of opinions or ways in which I can make a situation go um, I also think it looks nicer <laughs> <laughs> on the screen, it looks more generous, it looks more enticing, it's more interesting. Um, I think, yeah, as a player and as a person with eyes, I like three to five more than two. Um, and, I, and I think that most, most people do. Um, but that's, I know, I, like I saw a really good talk at GDC a few years ago by um, Alexis Kennedy, um, which was about choice, complicity and consequence. And he had a whole thing in it about like optimizing the amount of choices that there, that there are and it being, yeah, he, he also had the, I think, three to five zone, I believe. Sorry if I'm wrong, Alexis. Oh, sorry, that was the last question. So thanks very much, everyone. And if you want to chat to me afterwards, I'll be outside. So feel free. Thank you.